Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. We want to give you a welcome to the first uh, inaugural Marlboro STEM competition. My name is Meredith Harris, the executive director at the Marlboro Economic Development Corporation, also a member of the Marlboro STEM Council. I want to thank our sponsors this morning. There were several sponsors that uh, wanted to get involved in this event, which is really wonderful. Um, and we also have students from all three of our high schools that are participating today, which is just such a wonderful uh, thing for Marlboro and for all of you to be able to connect with uh, folks from our corporate, um, you know, folks in, in our community. So thank you all for being here. I want to give a special thank you to our three judges this morning from Quest Diagnostics, uh, from DuPont, and also from Boston Scientific. Thank you for taking the time this morning to connect with our students and, and to be involved with such a wonderful inaugural event. Um, with that, I want to introduce uh, the mayor of our city, Arthur Vigen, to give a couple of words of welcome. Thank you very much, Meredith. Uh, it really is great to be here. I just want to remind everyone when they do go off to college and, and do some traveling after that, make sure that you consider coming back tomorrow and working at one of our great companies. They're always going to welcome good students that want to learn and become good employees for their companies for many, many years to come. They're great companies to work for. Wish you all the best and good luck today. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We appreciate you being here with us this morning. And um, even if we have technical difficulties, it's still great to have you on and, and wishing our students well. So thank you. And with <laughs> that, we're going we're gonna to get things started really quick here with Nikita from, um, oh, I don't think I'm supposed to say what school they're from uh, to make sure that we're giving everybody a level playing field. So Nikita, if you want to kick it off, we'll turn it over to you. Look forward to hearing everybody's presentation. Thank you. Um, so my project was polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis using sodium dodecyl sulfate. And the two samples that I ran through this procedure were PB31 CD133 and PB31 EGFP. So to start off with some background on what this procedure really was. So gel, gel electrophoresis is a very common method that is used to separate um, either protein or DNA samples by mass. So to do this, a gel is first formed and it is usually formed with wells on the top as you can see in the diagram. And this gel can be formed with a variety of substances but the most common and perhaps the most efficient is an aggregate gel. So once the gel is created, the samples can be loaded into the wells on top and by attaching a power supply and running a current through the gel, the um, protein samples or DNA samples are able to run through the pores in the matrix of this gel um, so that the more heavier or ma mass having parts of the sample kind of stay near the beginning, which is near the cathode and the lighter parts of the sample move towards the anode. Um, so polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis is basically just a form of the same procedure, um, except instead of agarose, we use polyacrylamide, which is a different substance. And this one is a cross-linking substance. So it is formed through the polymerization of acrylamide along with a separate cross-linking reagent. And the one that I used is bisacrylamide. And um, PAGE is um, specifically used or really preferred for protein analysis because the pores in this gel are um, much smaller than the ones in, say, an agarose gel. So because the pores are smaller, it's easier for smaller molecules to um, travel through the gel and move towards the positive side of the electrode. Um, and it's also preferred because the proteins are much more pure at the end of this process than for most other gels and it takes much less time to run this gel and the gel solidifies very quickly also. Um, so the detergent that I used in this procedure was SDS or sodium dodecyl sulfate. So this step isn't very necessary, but um, it helps to denature and break apart these proteins and um, make them into like smaller parts so that it's easier for them to travel through the gel. And it also gives them a uniform negative charge. And when all the samples start off with a uniform negative charge, it's much easier for them to travel through the gel and um, get actual accurate results. Um, and so the samples that I used in this, um, well, the two target samples were PB31 CD133 and PB31 EGFP. So you can see in the diagram, there's the CD133 red vector inside our PB31 and the green EGFP vector inside the PB31. And um, I also used a third sample as a negative control and I used PUC19 for that. 
So the main steps of this procedure um, were expression, extraction, purification, and page. So I started off with plain protein samples and I went through each of these steps until they were ready to be run through a um, polyacrylamide gel. Um, so to start off, I started with expression. I started by expressing each of the protein samples in E. coli. I picked a BL21 DE3 strain and I used IPTG promoters to induce them. And then I extracted the proteins from these bacterial cells using cell lysis. And then I purified each of these cell extracts so that um, we just had the parts of the cells that contained the histidine tagged proteins. And finally, with our, our purified samples, I ran them through a page gel. So to start off with expression, I started by expressing the PB31 EGFP and PB31 CD133 in a BL21 D3 vector. So I inoculated three ML cultures of an empty expression vector, positive control plasmid, and recombinant expression plasmid. I incubated these overnight and then inoculated 10 milliliter cultures of each and let them incubate in a shaking incubator for almost two hours. And I checked them frequently throughout the day um, using a spectrophotometer so that I was able able to see when it reached mid log growth, which is kind of like the optimal stage to um, conduct uh, or to induce them with IPTG. So once they did reach that optimal stage, I transferred one microliter of each of the uninduced cultures to microcentrifuge tubes to kind of set them aside and run them through the gel later just to um, use them as a control and see the difference between the induced and uninduced samples. And then I induced the remaining culture with five microliters of IPTG stock. Um, IPTG is basically just a chemical reagent that um, helps protein expression or transcription to occur. It basically removes repressor from the lac operon and allows protein expression to happen. And finally, I centrifuged all of our samples at maximum speed. Maximum speed. Um, and once I finished with expression, I checked um, each of my samples in a fluorometer. Um, I checked both the induced and uninduced ones. As you can see, these were our results. I used um, water first, of course, just as a control to make sure everything was working properly. And then I checked the uninduced and induced strains. And I also checked the PB31 EGFP under a microscope because, of course, EGFP is the enhanced green fluorescent fluorescence protein and it um, ha has like quite a bright um, picture under a microscope. So I wanted to make sure that all the samples were working properly. So um, this is the picture that I got from under the microscope. And then I moved on to extraction. So I had to extract the proteins from each of the expressed cells. And to do this, I used Cellletic Express, which is a combination of enzymes and detergents that are um, combined in the most like optimized way for cell lysis. And it's specifically optimal for E. coli strains um, and BL21, which is perfect because that's um, the uh, samples that I used. So I used approximately 0.05 grams of the Cellulitic Express for each of my one milliliter samples. Um, I was able to mix it just by inverting the tubes, except for one of the tubes, which kind of refused to dissolve properly. So we had to pipette it a little bit. And then I incubated all these samples for approximately 15 minutes, just until the samples were completely transparent and visibly dissolved. Then I moved on to purification, which was um, unexpectedly probably the most difficult step because it required a lot of um, solutions that I had to create from scratch and a lot of calculations for the solutions to make sure that it was at the right concentration and we had the right concentration of imidazole stocks and all of that. So um, these were just some of my calculations for each of the buffers. I used a equilibration buffer, wash buffer, and elution buffer. And I used this on the uh, samples that we previously extracted in like the previous step. Um, then I moved on to um, starting the purification. So I selected his select spin columns for each of the samples. Um, so a Hisselect spin column is basically an immobilized metal ion affinity chromatography product. It helps for small scale cell extraction and purification, and it's pretty quick to be able to do all that. And it's also optimized for histidine tagged proteins, which was good because those were the proteins that I used. 
Um, and I started off by adding 600 microliters of equilibration buffer to the spin column, centrifuging that, and then loading the cell extract from the previous step onto the spin column, centrifuging that, and finally washing the unbound proteins from the spin column using a new collection tube. And I used around 600 microliters of wash buffer for that. And finally, I eluded the target protein using 500 microliters of elution buffer, and I finished by centrifuging, and I repeated the step for each of our samples. Um, and now that I had finished all three of those steps, I was ready to start PAGE um, because um, the protein samples were purified and as able to separate them based on their electrophoretic mobility. Um, I used the two samples that we had purified, which was the PAGE. 31 EGFP and PB31 CD133. And I also ran the uninduced strains from back in the expression, uh, expression step, which was the um, uninduced PB31 EGFP and again PB31 CD133. And finally, I also ran the PUC19, which was my negative control. And I started by adding the SDS gel loading buffer to each of these samples. Um, again, SDS is the detergent that helps to denature and break down these proteins while also giving them a uniform negative charge. So after I added the buffer, I heated the samples in an 85 degrees Celsius heat block so that the proteins would fully denature. And now that I was ready to load the samples, I washed the wells of the polyacrylamide gel with deionized water um, just to make sure that it was fully clean and not contaminated. And then I loaded each of the samples into the wells along with a DNA ladder, which is used um, to compare the results and see the size of each of the bands. And then I attached it to an electric power supply and I ran a current through the gel. So the future steps of this project include an analysis of our page results. Um, a Western blot is usually the most common um, next step for any paid gel. Um, so a Western blot basically allows the protein, the separated proteins from the gel to be transferred onto a separate membrane. Um, it's usually like a nitrocellulose um, matrix or a, PVD, or a PVDF membrane. Um, so we could transfer the separated proteins onto that and then detect which proteins um, were transferred using an enzyme or an antibody. Um, a lot of the time Western blotting is referred to as immunoblotting because an antibody is introduced to detect specific antigens. Um, and there are two detection methods that can be used. There's direct or indirect. A direct detection method is less commonly used, but it, it usually consists of introducing an enzyme um, into the transferred proteins and um, seeing which like antigen of interest is in the blot. Um, or you can use an indirect method, which is where an unlabeled primary antibody is first used to bind to the antigen, and then a primary antibody is detected using a separate enzyme. Um, so once Western blot is conducted, there are lots of applications that can be used for this kind of experiment. Um, page gels along with Western blots are used in almost any research that is conducted in any lab. Um, it has a variety of applications. Um, sometimes they're very preliminary just to see like what size the proteins are or if, they're, or if they've been purified properly, um, but they're a very vital step in almost any research. And yeah, that's basically it for my project. Um, if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Sure, I've got one for you, if that's all right. So what's a real world application of why you would wanna do this? Um, so for uh, the EGFP strain that I used, uh, EGFP can be used as a marker for almost any protein or any DNA sample because it has that fluorescence that um, is like easy to be seen and it's very easy to work with. So you could use this to detect like a cancer marker cell or for any other application for any other disease. Um, it's again, like PAGE is usually used to see if a protein was purified properly or if um, it was like the actual experiment was conducted properly. So it's usually used like as an analysis step to check in on the experiment and make sure it's been run properly. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I guess I have a question then. Is good, I'm unmuted. Um, so why did you pick this project? What attracted you to the allowed gel electrophoresis? Mm -hmm. 
So um, I was part of a research class where one of the um, main things that we did was gel electrophoresis. That was like one of the little activities that we did. And I thought that was really interesting because, well, we use like a normal agarose gel, but I thought it was really interesting how you could see how the proteins moved and how you could like separate the different components of such a small um, like substance or such a small like amount of protein and to be able to see the different parts of it, I thought was very interesting. So I did some research into different kinds of gel electrophoresis and I came across PAGE as one of the most common ones for protein samples. And um, yeah, I just thought it was very interesting and I thought it would be cool to be able to um, actually apply that and do that myself and conduct all the different steps that lead up to the PAGE gel also. Uh, so just as a follow-up to that, so you've done now both types of electrophoresis. Uh, did you what? Did you find one easier or better? Do you notice any differences between them? Um, I think I would say that the regular agarose gel was probably easier to do because, of course, it takes a lot less time and like um, like the components of preparing it is much easier. But I thought the page was much more interesting just to see how it worked and also um, just kind of like the re the steps that went into preparing the cell samples before that, I thought that was a little more interesting. All right, thank you. Okay. Uh, Nikita, I just have maybe a, a quick one. Um, so was there overall, was there a problem you're trying to solve here by using the, the methods that you did? In other words, are these not commonly used and um, they're more uh, state of the art or, or like overall, what was the problem that you were trying to solve, if you can explain? Um, so it wasn't necessarily a problem. It was more just kind of um, the purpose of learning how to conduct a paid gel because it's such a like vital part in so many different kinds of research. So I think the reason I mostly picked this was to learn how to do it and to be able to um, apply that on my own and like do different samples of it. <clears throat> but um, I also did want to see if the samples that we had in the lab um, were functioning properly kind of because what happened that summer was that uh, the fridge or freezer kind of didn't, uh, it either like stopped working or something happened with that. So we had to like save a bunch of samples. So one of the, like the goals of conducting this whole procedure was to make sure that both the PB31 EGFP and the PB31 CD133 were actually functioning properly and could be continued to use in future experiments. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that. Next up, we have Alex. Let me start off. Hi, my name is Alex Dorval, and for my project, I, I decided to make a welding light. So for the problem I had found is while welding, there is an issue of there not being enough light in some places to see well when not running an arc. In order to increase efficiency, it is easier to leave your helmet on the entire time. So what should be done to help with the lack of light? The answer is easy, to have a light attached to your helmet that will not throw off your balance while supplying enough light to work with. It also has to have a switch that can be used easily with gloves on, allowing even more time to be saved. This is to help welders when not just welding or chipping slag, but also grinding in not well-lit areas. So to better understand what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the light is, I have the picture at the bottom right, which is uh, TIG weld, fillet weld, normal weld we do. And so what it is, is it's half when you just look at it with your normal eyes and half through the welding helmet when you're not welding. As you can see in the circled area, there is not enough light to be able to see the toes of the weld perfectly to not know if there are any discontinuities allowing you to have a failed weld. So hopefully with my project, I, was, I wanted to be able to see the toes and the entire weld to be able to look through it through my helmet and not have to waste time picking it up and putting it back down while welding. So for my design criteria, it had to be lightweight. It cannot harm the helmet because for a welder, the helmet is very crucial. It is a very personal thing. We put a bunch of stickers on it and I don't wanna be able to harm it and I wanna be able to take it off easily so we can transfer it from grinding shields to helmets to anything you could use it on. So it's not just a one purpose tool. It can be used on many different things easily. And, but it still has to be strong enough that if you're welding on a skyscraper or just above someone, it doesn't fall off and hit them in the middle of welding, which can cause injury, and that's never good. And I want to be able to use it with gloves because gloves are important. You don't want your hands burning up. So when you're welding, 
you want to keep your gloves on, but some of them are very thick. So I had to find a switch that was able to be rockered back and forth with thick stick welding gloves, as opposed to the thin TIG welding gloves, which are used most of the time in TIG welding, which is a very low heat procedure. And so I had done some product research to see if this was actually applicable. There are two other products that I had found. They're both pictured on the screen. There is the Miller Welding Company's headlight, but it is not easily attachable because you have to unscrew the side of your helmet to be able to put the light onto your helmet, causing it to not be efficient in, if you have to use it in somewhere else, you have to unscrew your helmet and then put it back on. And then that can mess with your set, that can mess with how your helmet feels and mess with your welding. And then the bottom one is a small little button that is supposed to be pressed that is hard to find gloves on as I had read some reviews that had said that. And then the last one was one I found on a forum that was homemade and you drilled into your helmet, which is never a good idea because you don't want to ruin your helmet. And so the forums I'd found these products on also talked about how they had experienced these same issues of lighting issues. So I, I had not just pulled, or I had not just welded on forums, looked on forums, I had also pulled fellow students of mine that were interested in welding, as well as other welders I had known from learning to weld. These, they had, um, there were on half of these people that had experienced this issue, as well as over 93% wanted to, would be willing to purchase this device to put on their own helmet or other things. So for the initial product design, I had designed this thing terribly. I built it with a frame of mind of not being able to not being able to build it or 3d print it as you can see in the bottom right it had this weird um, weird right angle thing that was just wasn't going to work properly for manufacturing purposes so I had to redesign it which took about took me about a week because it, it's a lot of thinking and I had to use the parts that I had I basically took the entire lighting system of a old flashlight I had and put it into this product that I 3d printed so for testing, I wanted to be able to test lighting, secureness, helpfulness, and intuitiveness. For lighting, I wanted to try welding joints in different positions and varying light conditions because in the field, there will always be a different light condition for any weld you're doing. You're not always on a bench welding doing that. There are, you're in the field, you're under a bridge, you're in a skyscraper. So I wanted to try to replicate as many of those as I could to test it. Secureness, I wanted to basically put it on my helmet, shake the crap out of my helmet and hope it wouldn't fall off. It did not. And then helpfulness. I wanted to know if it actually helped in seeing those toes of the weld that, uh, as I had mentioned earlier. And then intuitiveness. Um, I wanted to give it to someone without explaining anything and see if they could figure out how it worked and what it would, and what it would do and they would be able to use it without me having to give them step-by-step -step instructions. So for testing results, the lid needs to stay on better because I had, had a janky way of putting it on. It wasn't very helpful. It, we ended up just wrapping it in tape so I could test it. It can be a little lighter as it threw off some people's balance, but some people's it didn't. It all depended on what helmet they had had before. Some helmets are heavier than others and some are lighter than others. And then the magnets can be smaller because those create a lot of unnecessary weight. And then the wiring could be better. This was my first time actually soldering to a board as you can see, I had pointed it to an arrow to where I soldered connection to the board. It wasn't my best work. It worked. It was a little finicky on putting the lid on, so it would sometimes flash and do weird things. And then, so these are some pictures of my prototyping stage. This, the photo on the left, is me finally being able to fit the switch in on the back. As you can see, it's a pretty good sized switch, so you can easily use it with gloves. The, the second picture is the hole I had. I had to resize it a little because 3D printing isn't always exact. It's sometimes smaller, it's sometimes bigger. So I had to go through that process. This is my, uh, the third picture is the finished uh, shell after I just printed it. And then the last picture is everything together without the lid on. It's very cramped. So that's what was mostly messing with my board and causing it to just flash and sometimes be inconsistent. So this was me testing it. I had the helm I had it on my left side of my helmet just to test it there. This was me TIG welding and just messing around seeing if it would help. So for future improvements, I wanted to make it lighter, have a better lid attachment, and have more reliable welding. That just comes down to my 
skill at soldering. And then smaller magnets because, well, the magnets I had were good. They were unnecessarily big because um, I could have gotten away with smaller magnets. And then it needs to be more low profile if I can do that so I can get into smaller spaces. Because if you look at the picture, welding can be in very tight, confined spaces, especially TIG welding, because those are what a lot of the time boiler makers are using when they're making stainless steel boilers. And then, so for the final outcome, it needs some improvement. It's a product I'm proud of. I'm very happy I got to get a better understanding of this design process in building this prototype and knowing how hard it is just to design products that go into market. So with that, um, I'm opening the floor to questions if you guys have any. Sure, I've got one. So okay. Is there any, uh, any relationship between um, when the light is on and when you're actually welding? So it makes sense to me, and I'll preface this by saying I'm not a welder, right? But it makes sense to me that you want to be able to see what you're doing when you get started. But is there any harm to that light being on once you start welding? Not, is that going to be too much light for you? Not really, because of helmets now where they're auto darkening and you can change the shade, it doesn't affect it because all you can see when it goes dark, it's about a shade 10. All you can see when it goes dark is that puddle and the arc. You can't really see anything outside of that. It's all black unless you have light coming in from the back, but it's not going to affect your weld while you're welding or it's not going to affect how you see the weld while you're welding. It's mostly for that before you start, you can make sure you're right where you want to be and you're not welding on like the opposite side of the of the piece. And you can, just a follow-up question. So before you get started with the weld, that's enough light for you to see what you're doing through the mask and then you rely on the auto darkening? Yep. Is that right? Yeah. Before that, before auto darkening helmets, it would be a single shield that would always be dark. So you'd have to flip your helmet down and right. start welding. So now with the auto darkening, that's the main reason why we're able to have lights on our helmets, because if you didn't, then it would have to be, then it just kind of wouldn't work because you're flipping your helmet up and down constantly. Excellent. Thank you. So I have a question. When looking at your materials of construction, did you have any concerns of safety having a large plastic, possibly flammable piece of stuff stuck to your helmet? Um, and did you you know, look to then if you were to produce this to market, um, did you do any research into non-flammable plastics and materials to use for the safety aspect of welding? So I know this was mostly a lot of prototyping. I know 3D printing can be strong if you print the layers in a certain way. There's The layers tend to break when they're bent weird. So with how I printed it, it wasn't going to break. But I didn't, I didn't get a chance to look into certain plastics. I know I'd want to make it out of a solid plastic instead of 3D printing it because that would be more reliable and I can pick a plastic that would be less flammable. I'd probably go with something along the lines of what helmets are made of now because they tend to melt and not be flammable, which causes a lot less damage. So that, that's my answer. All right. Alex, I have uh, one. Um, for the amount of lighting, did you determine like the actual amount of lumens you wanted to achieve? Um, or was it more of a just provide extra lighting? It was more of just to provide extra lighting. Lumens weren't, I didn't really think about that. It was a lot of, I had, we carry flashlights. When I, when I was welding, I carry flashlights. So I basically took one of the ones I had carried, bought a couple extra and used that as my baseline for the one that I wanted to put it, the amount of light I wanted to put into my prototype. Okay, thank you. If anyone has any more questions, I'd be happy to answer. If not, thank you for watching. I hope you found this interesting and insightful on my project. Thank you, Alex. No problem. Alex, thank, thank you, you very much. Next up, we have Darren. Can you guys hear me all right? Yes, we can. Good morning. Good morning. I just want to thank the judges for coming out and taking time out of your day to check out our projects and Mr. Vital for setting this whole thing up. Um, I'm going to share my screen.
You guys see that all right? All right. So my project was a longboard. And for those of you who don't know what a longboard is, it's basically a skateboard, but a lot longer. And it's meant for uh, cruising. And I've always been into like longboarding and skateboarding since I was really young, but particularly particularly longboarding. Um, so this is a project I've always wanted to work on. I'm happy I got the opportunity to do it this year. So for the materials, I ended up going with some sanded birch wood. I just got this from Lowe's. It was pretty cheap. Um, some recommended wood. A lot of people use, it's called Baltic birch, which is really strong and flexible. It's a good wood for a, a longboard project. But I went uh, searching for it. It was about like 80 bucks for a piece and I needed two pieces. So I was like, actually, I'll uh, pump the brakes here and I'll go with some a little cheaper. But I, I, I liked how um, the birch turned out because it's pretty flexible. And for the wood, I used Gorilla Brand wood glue. I, um, a lot of wood clamps from when I was gluing it together. My bad. Um, a jigsaw, a table saw, longboard wheels, longboard trucks, um, riser pads, which uh, I didn't actually know what riser pads were until I was researching how to make a homemade longboard. They're basically these rubber, little rubber pieces that you put um, underneath the trucks when you screw it into the board. And since they're rubber, they, um, they take a lot of shock. Um, so they reduce vibration when you're riding, which um, worked, worked really well. I tried, the, I tried the board out without the riser pads and I could definitely feel a difference. I could feel a lot more vibration in my feet when I was riding. So this was a good purchase. Um, screws and nuts. I finished off the whole board with a clear coat polyurethane, which I'll show you guys some pictures, um, some grip tape on the top. I, I got a sanding machine for this project, which isn't actually, it um, wasn't expensive because I did some searching around and I actually had a sanding machine in my basement, which I had no clue. So that was free. Um, some red and white paint and Mod Podge. So I'll just let you guys know the whole process. Step one, um, finding the right wood. And I got into this a little bit. Um, I ended up going with a... Uh, sanded birch and it was two foot by four foot and quarter inch thick thick um one sec so i started this off by using my table saw to cut the wood into three pieces that were 10 inches wide because i knew my board was going to be nine inches wide and i wanted to give myself a little bit of space for when i was cutting with my jigsaw um Step three was gluing the wood, which um, I didn't realize how, I knew the wood was going to be flexible, but I didn't realize how flexible it was going to be. So I ended up gluing it with a bend in the board um, so that when I was using the board and I stepped on it, it would kind of flatten out even. And I used Gorilla Brand wood glue for this and a spatula to spread the, woo, uh, spread the glue on each piece of wood evenly. And then I ended up I didn't want to buy more clamps because I only had like six. So I kind of went on this little scavenger hunt to all my friends' houses. And I ended up gathering about 22 wood clamps that I put around when I was gluing. And that really helped secure the board and press it down so it was tight everywhere and glued in well. Um, step four was cutting the wood into the shape of a longboard, which was definitely by far the most tedious step. Um, cutting it wasn't terrible, even though I've never used a jigsaw, I had to practice before. Um, I'd say the hardest part of this step was tracing the longboard because I knew how wide I wanted it to be and I knew how long I wanted it to be. Um, but it was hard to get the exact shape and to have it, um, pretty symmetrical on both sides. So this was probably the longest step, just trying to figure out how I wanted to shape the board before I cut it. And here was another tough step was drilling the holes because the holes had to be very close to the um, inside edge of this board. And um, the problem was when I started my the first hole that I drilled, it ended up splitting the wood on the inside edge. And I was like, okay, this is not this is not ideal. So I uh, I went over with my dad and got some scrap pieces of wood and we practiced and I got it down. And the other seven holes I had to drill ended up going in pretty easily. Step six was sanding. Um, this I did a lot of sanding just to make sure there's no rough edges. 
And then step seven, I decorated the board. And around the time I was decorating, I had just committed to North Carolina State. So I ended up going with that theme. So I stenciled in the NC State words and I used a permanent marker for that. And then I just printed out this little mascot and I shellacked it on there just using Mod Podge. Um, step eight was adding the clear coat. Um, and I, I use this clear coat polyurethane I found at Lowe's, which is good for protecting your wood from dirt and water damage. And it ended up keeping the, uh, the um, printed out piece of paper with the mascot on pretty well. Um, step nine, adding the grip tape to the top. Um, for this, I ended up using a screwdriver to kind of rub around the edges and get it to stick. And it gave me a good outline for where I was going to use my razor to cut the excess grip tape off. Um, and then the final step was screwing the trucks into the board. Um, and this is the final product. So I can take you guys, if you guys have any questions, I can take those now. Going through this build process, um, if you had to build another board, are there any changes you would make or things you would do differently? Yeah, I think I would use a different type of wood just to try it out. Um, I was happy with the type I used on this one because um, I tried the first time I tried out the board was yesterday when I turned it in at, at my uh, at my school, and I was kind of just riding it around with my friends, and it felt really comfortable. It's one of the more comfortable boards I've ridden. Um, but I think next time I would try maybe bamboo because that's a very popular option. Um, it's a little stiffer and it still has a good amount of flexibility. Um, and I would probably also, instead of um, cutting uh, little holes into each end and then screwing in the trucks that way, I would use a different type of truck that uh, doesn't have here. I'll show you. So this type of truck, it has two components to it. It has this metal piece on the top and then it has the um, another metal piece on the bottom and you kind of screw it in like that, but you got to do it with a hole in the middle so the truck goes through. Um, there's different type of trucks that don't require you to cut a hole in the middle of the board. You can just stick the truck underneath the wood and then screw it in. And I think that would kind of help with my issue of um, drilling that I saw in, in, this, um, in this project that I did because I had to drill really close to the edge um, so it was kind of tough. So I think next time I would use a different type of truck that I can just drill directly into the board and it won't be near any edges. So Darren, I've got a question for you. So it seems like you've built this uh, board for your personal use, which is great. Uh, you know, is this a pro you know, did you develop a process that could be replicated? Meaning, is this something now you could make, you know, a hundred, a uh, hundred long boards fairly easily? Yeah. Or would, I would this be much more of a customization type product? I would say I could definitely use this process again to make more boards. And uh, my family's kind of joking about it. They're saying like, oh, you should start up your own longboard business. And I was like, I, don't, I know a lot of friends that um, are really into riding. So maybe I could try making more boards and just messing around with, um, with different types of wood and whatnot. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Darren, just have a question. Um, did, did you follow a design um, process to determine how much um, like weight ballast you wanted to create the bend? Or how did you, was that more uh, trial and error? That was pretty trial and error, yeah. yeah. Um, I knew it was going to take a good amount of bend, so I used a good amount of weight. Um, the, the initial amount of weight I was going to use, I don't think would have been enough, but when I was gluing and I looked at it, I was like, this is going to need a little bit more bend. So I added more weight and it worked out pretty well. Okay. If we don't have any more questions, I think we'll go to the next student. I think that was actually from Marlboro Regional Chamber of Commerce in the chat as well was how much weight uh, could it hold. So thank you for, for answering that. So up next, we have Gil Hearn. Hi. Uh, you can just call me Guy, it's fine. It's uh, easy to pronounce. One second. All right, 
Hi. Uh, can you guys see me and hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. So my project was in um, manufacturing a bug repellent because, um, you know, a big problem is that we don't really have an efficient way to repel bugs now. We have, obviously, you know, you could hire an exterminator, but you have to leave your house and the chemicals they use could be harmful for you and your pets and such. So my goal was to make like a, a device that could keep bugs away. And initially, I was thinking about those plug-in devices in the, that um, they advertised as using the high-frequency sounds. And I saw a few videos and reviews on it. Didn't really work that well. There was actually a video where a rat just walked right up to it, and nothing happened. So what I did is I acquired cockroaches from the Carolina Biological website, and I separated them into different groups. And within those groups, I made four different mixtures, just using like natural essential oils because I was trying to use the smell of the oils to repel them away. And I separated them into those four different groups. And each group got a different um, percentage of each of the essential oils I used. And I tried to make it so they would either stay away or die from the, the, uh, the mixture. So I did some research and I found out that peppermint, cinnamon, lavender, and eucalyptus were all used previously as natural repellents from bugs. And, you know, I also found out that the supersonic sound wave plug-in devices do not work well, if at all. That was my engineering goal. And the materials I used were peppermint, essential oil, eucalyptus, cinnamon, vinegar. I also got these cages so I could keep them in. Food for the cockroaches, these little vials so I could mix them. Petri dishes were used to um, put the mixture into the petri dish and then place it inside the cage as shown over here. And candle wax. My methodology was this, um, the cockroaches were used to like represent a, uh, a bug. The way I got to that conclusion was, you know, cockroaches are really hard to get rid of. So I said, you know, I'm going to try to get rid of cockroaches since they're the hardest because if it gets rid of cockroaches, it will most likely get rid of any other bug. Then I made um, four different mixtures. One of them was um, vinegar, eucalyptus, and cinnamon. The number is two. The second one was two doses of peppermint, one dose of cinnamon. The third one was two doses of eucalyptus, one dose of cinnamon. And the fourth one was peppermint, eucalyptus, and, and cinnamon, all equal just one doses. And each dose is a quarter milliliter. Yeah. So my procedure was to, first I made the mixtures and I put them inside the cage, saw if the cockroaches went towards it or away from it, if it repelled them at all, they avoided it. Then I'd see how they, I would time it for like every 10 minutes, every 10 minutes or so, five minutes or so, I'll see how they, how far apart they were from the, the petri dish. And then after I got the results from that, I developed it into a wax because I decided it'd be a good idea to just make it into a candle because everybody likes candles and, you know, it's just a good scent to have in your house when you're burning a candle. So why not, you know, make a candle that can also keep bugs away. So then these were results from the first test with the petri dish. Uh, the first solution was the first solution was pretty good. Uh, second solution was even better. As you can see, it kept them away for like 52 centimeters after 20 minutes. They kept like avoiding it more and more as time went on. Then this was the third solution. This is the fourth one. Yeah, those were the results. So then I made it into a wax, which I have right here, the wax. And to making the waxes, I did two different ways. Um, so this one, I just mixed it in with the actual wax. When I was melting the wax, I added this, the scents in. And then this one, I added it afterwards. And then there's one right here where I added it afterwards and in the mix. And that one was the one that released the strongest smell. It was uh, very strong and my room still smells like that. And I did it about two weeks ago. So, um, yeah, that's it. If anybody got any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Sure, I'll go first. So uh, as far as the candle goes, is this for uh, indoor use or outdoor use? Well, I tested it indoors because it's easier to, you know, keep the scent inside the room. But I don't think it would work that well outdoors, especially if it's like windy, because the scent would just go all the way elsewhere. And just uh, talk a little bit about the scent, right? I mean, I know like outdoors, you would use a citronella candle that has a very, very harsh scent to it. But scent seemed to be a big, a big part of your criteria, correct? Yeah, yeah, keeping the, the scent strong 
and for like longing less long you know you don't want a scent that will only last for five minutes because you could use it during the day and then the bugs come in at night you know there was no point of using it and this stayed on in my room pretty pretty well right but strong scent but more a more pleasant scent is what you that as well yeah that was another thing I, I made it, um, I made a survey and in that survey, I found out that people didn't really like the eucalyptus and the vinegar as much as they'd like the other scents. So I try to make more mixtures with the scents that are more pleasing to people because you don't want something that smells bad for you as well. Great. Thank you. Yep. So in your initial criteria, you talked about, uh, this being a more natural, safer product. Um, again, vinegar, eucalyptus oil, all these oils have chemical data safety sheets. Did you review those to look at what are the hazards and dose limits for, uh, these materials? Um, just cause it's natural doesn't mean it doesn't have some side effects or harmful properties. Right. Now uh, I did some research and I found out that some people had a few accident accidents with those, um, diffusers that you put the the actual um, the soils into so I had to watch out for that. I didn't take a look at the actual data sheet, the safety data sheet, but I just um I just try to find accidents that had happened with the these um, oils, and I try to stay away and not repeat what those people did. Okay. Do you have ideas on um, on how else this could be used besides candles for those um, that do not? want to burn candles in their homes yeah sure um you could also uh, just make the actual mixture because it also does release a strong smell um i i forgot to include the pictures here of the cockroaches but yeah the, the cockroaches they died you know and they stayed away from just the scent i didn't have to really burn the candle so you could just make the scent with the mixtures you could you know you could do many things you could my in the beginning what i wanted to do is um make like a a wax that you could put in a wax burner instead of making a candle. But candle was, you know, because of the times, it was easier to make a candle than make a little cartridge for a wax burner. But you could do a wax burner and you could, you could do those sorts of things. Like rub it on, let's say, oh, I have a hole in the wall where the, the ants or cockroaches are coming into. You rub the, the liquid on that little hole instead of burning a candle. You could just, you know, use the mixture. Okay, thank you. I have one more question. Um, so on this methodology side, you picked four different mixtures of material. Um, and also you defined a dose as a fourth millimeter. Um, did that come from background research on how these blend together, how they go, or how did you design that DOE? I, um, I did the research on all of them individually. And I found out that like peppermint and cinnamon were being used in labs to try and keep like larvae and spe specific bugs and mosquitoes away. And I found out that lavender was trying, starting to be used, but not as much. And I said, mm, what's another good scent? And I remember that as a kid, I used to smell eucalyptus. And my grandma used to say that it would uh, keep bugs away. So I did a lot of research in eucalyptus to try to find something. And I also found out that there was, they were starting to be used just as lavender is being used to try and keep more like fleas and bugs away. But I didn't find anything of them being used together. I did find a few of them that used like, peppermint vinegar or cinnamon and vinegar, stuff like that, or like those DIY YouTube videos on how to, you know, repel bugs. But I didn't find any specific, like, tests on, with all of them being used together. Okay, thank you. Yep. Zach, whenever you're ready, we're ready for you. Hello, everyone. My name is Zachary Marques, and uh, I will be pitching an actual logistic planning app um, hitting home on the technology aspect of STEM. Um, and it's an idea for a logistical planning app that can be used for the uh, efficiency and post-COVID in-person socialization uh, planning that I think we could bring to society and I think uh, it could be of great use. So I wanted to start off by why it's named PLAT. So I think a few people have, have heard of the term PLAT, but it's a little bit of a unique term. And it's defined by Google as the noun is a plot of land and the verb is to plan or map out a piece of land or construction site. So it's generally used as a term in real estate or construction. But I was intending to re reinstate the use of the word as mapping out your social life or mapping out the logistics of your social life. So over the last 14 months or so, uh, I'm reflecting on all the positives and negatives of the pandemic, 
I, I kind of came across the actual easeability and, and efficiency we had in making social plans. Um, just sitting at home, it was just a simple Zoom link or a simple text or a simple FaceTime to a friend, a colleague, or a neighbor saying, uh, let's connect over Zoom or let's, let's FaceTime each other and let's get together. Uh, those were our social plans over the last 14 months or so. And I just thought that was very efficient and it's very easy. And I was kind of questioning to myself, how could we bring this logistical ease to the post-COVID normalcy and return to in-person socialization? So I wanted to come up with a scenario here. So here is Jill. She is a, a mom of two young boys and she's very overwhelmed right now. She, she has her mother's 75th birthday coming up in about three weeks. She's trying to plan her youngest son's uh, pizza party that's coming up on Friday. She's uh, planning a family vacation with, with her family that's spread out across the entire country uh, in three months. And she's also trying to balance her own life of work and, and the gym and her uh, marriage. She's just feeling overwhelmed. So Platt comes in. And I'm gonna be describing a bit of the unique features of what Platt would entail. So Platt would be a, a logistical app and a, a type of social media of which everyone would have their own profile, just as, as like Facebook and Instagram, that would have your name, your, or your bio, your photo, and a little bit of information about you. But what would be unique to Platt is there would be a calendar feature. And every user would have their own calendar in which they can block off their events and their day and, and kind of display to everyone in a public or private setting of what they have going on. So there could be a feature, there will be a feature of which there's a generic block off that you wouldn't share with anyone that just shows you're busy and it would be uh, a universal box that every user knows. It's just uh, a logistical uh, event that they don't wanna share. And another feature would be you can share the event. So essentially this app is allowing you to view other people's calendars in our return to in-person uh, hangouts and to see when people are available and when they're not. This can be used to avoid conflicts and also to efficiently see when your friends or family members are available and free to potentially join an event. Messaging. Furthermore, Platt would have a messaging feature in which you can send, uh, similar to a Zoom link in the virtual world, but a message to um, join an event on the Platt calendar. So that would include a date, a time, logistics, the information, all the details uh, about the event that, that would be sent through Platt. And then there would be similar to Zoom and other features an accept a decline or a comment feature in which people could share if they were attending, they couldn't attend, uh, what time would be better. And at the same time, the organizer who sent out that message would have an analysis of all the responses from these people that the event was sent to. And this is gonna add extreme efficiency and remove the stress of planning events in person. I think that over the last 14 months, many people have gotten used to just sending out a Zoom link or sending out uh, a text saying, let's FaceTime at three o'clock. Platt would allow this messaging feature of efficient messages and efficient coordinating of events into to in-person uh, events. So what makes Platt, uh, what would make Platt sustain in this competitive business and technology market? Besides the calendar and the messaging feature, Platt would, uh, would uh, be able to coordinate with other hotels, events, and restaurants, and um, event venues uh, through the app. So for example, let's go back to Jill. She's trying to plan her vacation with her family members across the country, and let's say in the Bahamas. And she doesn't have the time to individually text all of her sisters, her brothers, her cousins about the event, what room they're in, when they're coming, when they're staying. Through Platt, these event venues and, and, and spaces would be able to coordinate with Platt so that when someone received a message saying, uh, oh, I'm attending and, and they signed up for their hotel room and their departure and their arrival time through, let's say a Marriott restaurant or a, and a, a Marriott resort, all the logistics of their stay would be brought back to Platt as well. So that the organizer of the event would have all the details of all the guests, their stays and the logistics in one place. So instead of Jill being overwhelmed with figuring out when her sister's leaving, when, when she's arriving, what hotel room she's in, her flight, all these events could be, all these logistics would be brought right into her analysis of when they're coming, their hotel room, all the information in one spot. And essentially this is kind of mapping off of like a DoorDash business model. So for example, on DoorDash, companies pay to be on the app so that they can be marketed and promoted through the app. And at the same time, 
DoorDash will get a commission of every purchase of um, food bought through DoorDash. So on Plat, companies would pay to be on Plat to be marketed and promoted. And at the same time, all events and uh, business conducted through Plat via Marriott, res- Marriott or a restaurant or uh, like a venue, Plat would receive a commission of the purchase because it was conducted via Plat. So what are some of the contributions to society and technology that Platt are bringing? Well, I do think this app would significantly improve mental health. I think many people coming off of this pandemic are not only stressed about actually seeing people in person again and returning to society a bit, but they're actually, there is stress behind coordinating events and the logistics. This app would allow people to just kind of sit back, send a message to someone, coordinate an event without having to stress about texting people, sending an amazing text uh, that will invite someone. It's going to take away that stress and provide efficiency and easeability that you can just send a link and people can accept it, decline it, or comment and see if they're joining and it would automatically go to their calendar. Um, this statistic is for the professional world, but uh, event planning is, is ranked as a very high stressful job. And I think that can also be corresponding to the personal life as well. People have a lot on their plate. Uh, there's a lot going on with returning to life. This app can significantly reduce anxiety. And I do believe that this could be uh, applicable to all demographics and all users, because for example, if there's a guy trying to ask a girl out to ice cream on a Friday, instead of having to stress out about sending this amazing text to a girl that's gonna want her to say yes or uh, accept his approval to go on a date or go to get ice cream, it would just be a simple message saying, ice cream five to six on Friday. The the kid will uh, have a lot less stress And it'll it'll simply be an accept, a decline, or a comment. And instead of having it be a big deal or stressing about, oh, is the girl going to leave me on red or send a bad message or make fun of me, it would just be a simple decline button. At the same time, I think grandma receiving this message on, on on her side, all she has to do is click accept, decline, or comment. It's significantly reducing the the time uh, and the stress behind planning an event because it's just as simple as a click of a button. And then the organizer has all their information in one spot. So eventually, uh, if, when in creating this app, my goal would be for it to be applicable for all situations, demographics, and users, regardless of age, situation, environment, and also for Plat to become a verb. Because I think um, I, I know that Facebook, Instagram messaging apps, people would say Facebook me, DM me. Eventually, the goal would be for it to be Plat me. Uh, which would be kind of like a verb that everyone kind of knew. And instead of saying, oh, someone text me about an event, plat me about it. In closing, uh, I do potentially plan to bring this app idea uh, with me to college next year and potentially try and uh, pursue creating it. But I, I think this would be a technological advancement to provide comfortability and efficiency in logistical planning of in-person events uh, in our post-COVID return to normalcy. I want to thank you all for your generous time today. We're really appreciative and I'm open for any questions, comments, or concerns. All right. Uh, I don't know if you're aware, Google Plus had a very similar situation when Google Plus launched, the, the failed Google media, Google social media, where they integrated Google calendars, which you can have public and private versions of that calendar um, that are have most of the features you're describing here. Um, how would Plat work when Google failed at doing this? I think Platt would be, do you know exactly when Google came out that? that uh, it I'm launched brain- 2011 and I think they finally killed it in like 2016, 2017-ish. Okay, okay. I think Platt would offer the messaging feature which would be very applicable to our current time frame. I think in t- 2011, I think that was probably a high advance. At, like it was a, a strong technological advancement. But coming off of COVID, I think this would be something type of something new to the market that people would kind of feel comfortable with because we've kind of been used to doing it virtually over the past few months. And at the same time, I think um, with with the coordinating between other companies and the event venues and and being able to have all the information of when an event is planned at a at a venue or a location immediately for the organizer on their end, I think that would be very beneficial because I think a lot of companies and products are, are available right 
now in the professional world for, for those aspects, but not necessarily the personal plan. Thank you. Zachary, um, you mentioned bringing this uh, potentially um, to, to college to, to try to take this next step. Um, have you researched what it will take to get it to the next step to essentially get you know a prototype version or beta version that you can test? Um, and if so, what are the main roadblocks that you, you feel you might need to, uh, to go through? I haven't exactly researched yet. Um, it was kind of an idea I came up with literally just sitting on my couch at home because I was kind of reflecting on, on COVID and what, what's been going on. I think trying to look ahead, some of the roadblocks would be um, marketing the app because I, do, I am aware that there are other versions of this app in terms of Google Plus and other failed um, options. At the same time, some people could, I think some uh, critical responses could be, oh, this exists in the professional world. Why would you want to bring this to uh, the personal world? And I would do my best to explain the, the efficiency and the feasibility it would bring to personal planning. Um, I think I, I would have to obviously code the app and, and um, connect with others. I think I, I would have to definitely form a team because I'm a little bit more of the business-minded person. Um, and I would need to work with people who are a little stronger in technology and, and coding and actually putting the app um, to work. All right, thank you. Zachary, just uh, playing this out a little bit. So assume you've got the app built and it's, it's ready to go. Um, so just the, as far as the workflow of it and how it actually works. So I'm a, I'm a Plat user and I want to set up a, a social function. Can I only hit up other Plat members or would this be something I could plug in someone's phone number, or email address, right? And then it would kind of would invite them to download Plat. How do you, how do you envision that working? Yes. Um, and I was speaking to some friends earlier about my about the presentation and someone asked the same question. I, what the original goal, what, would, what, it would, would, what it would be, would to have a message be sent to someone and you could send it via their phone number and it would have two things. It would also have the accept, decline and comment feature, but it would also invite them to download Plat so that it was kind of like both responses in one. Because the goal would be obviously to market the app and try and expand it out to the population. But the goal, similar to uh, um, other types of apps that you can use email or name or phone number, uh, the goal would be to have it so that you could send it to a phone number and they can respond alike. And instead of having them pop up as a user in the app, their phone number or their name could just hit the analysis of the organizer so that it will provide the information uh, just the same as if someone were a user but it just won't be as in depth unless someone were to create a profile um, to have all the features that everyone else would have. So I think that would be an important step in the beginning of the app because when the app, if the app were first created, not everyone would have the app and there would be many people who are unfamiliar. So having that feature that people could still respond and still coordinate the event without downloading it would be important to the organizer. And then hopefully someone would be interested and see the information that would be attached uh, and consider downloading flat. All right, and I have one last question. Uh, you said you wanted this open to all ages. Did you do any research into what privacy and regulatory issues there are with having minors on the, on the NAP and their schedules and where they're located, basically publicly available? Yes, I, I think I, I, I misspoke in terms of saying all ages, but you're correct, I, I did say that. Um, that would be a privacy concern because uh, having the calendars of of, of children could definitely be a concern, especially if it has the location and the exact time and date of where they are. Um, that would be something I would definitely need to look into because that would cross over into, um, for example, other social media platforms such as Instagram and Snapchat where your location and where you are is, is very accessible. Um, I think that would, that would definitely be a concern because uh, on other platforms, it, it can be a, a bit um, confused as to where you are, but Platt would have your exact location. Um, to be honest, I didn't consider that completely. Um, and that would definitely be something to consider. I think limiting the app to 18 year olds would be potentially limiting, but at the same time, I do think this app is a bit more advanced in logistical planning. I think if you're 14 or 13, you may not actually look this far ahead or say, Oh, I'm going to plat my friends for Friday night. I think this as an 18 and above app could be more useful because uh, it takes the maturity of logisticals planning and actually organizing, event, 
organizing events uh, into consideration, but I would definitely need to look into the, the privacy aspect. All right. Thank you. If there are no other questions, we would say thank you very much to Zachary. Um, and we're gonna welcome Ryan. Thank you very much. So the project that I did was uh, a mission to Mars um, my sophomore year. Um, what we did was we, as a STEM team, we were assigned um, to create a hypothetical uh, mission in trying to uh, set up a habitat on Mars. Um, we were assigned teams, so me and uh, three others uh, were given a set of responsibilities um, to set up a colony. We had to research specific topics and uh, each member documented what they did, um, which I really enjoyed because although we each had our separate topics, we could still be connected. So the uh, research components that we uh, looked into was creating a rocket, designing a colony, uh, building a rover on Mars, ir an irrigation system, and a communication system. So unfortunately, we only had four members. Um, so we did not have someone for the communication system. But in the end, it didn't become a problem because we could all uh, work on our separate things, our separate components, and come together um, to make something pretty cool. So each member would document what they did each day we worked on our project. Um, so what I did was I was in charge of um, creating a research, uh, researching a space habitat. Um, so what I did was we had to create a brochure um, and set out what we were all gonna do for the project. Um, the first thing that we did was we created an uh, engineering design process for each uh, component. And as the person who researched the space habitat, I did a lot of research into uh, college research that had been done and uh, what NASA had looked at in creating a habitat um, on Mars, which I thought was super cool because some of the things like that I was reading at the time, I had no idea what it meant. Um, but just that wonder of this is possible and living on Mars was super cool to me. Uh, so I would go online and find sites and uh, look at prototypes that real uh, rocket engineers and designers actually created and um, take notes and look over. Uh, we had a set of criteria that each of our, uh, for the habitat. So like I said, we had our prototype had to include an oxygen and water development, a research station, uh, a living quarter, and a storage for food and water. Um, so what we did was we got to design a 3D print on a creoparametric, and we designed uh, an actual habitat. Unfortunately, we weren't able to print uh, the actual design just because of timing, but I was super proud of my, uh, my project and we can see that in a couple slides, but that was my first time using uh, Creo and uh, 3D printing and that's what really made me fall in love with it. And the next two years after that, I took a CAD class um, so that, and that's 
that's what really made me fall in love with like engineering. So I thought that was super cool. So this is actually what I made. Um, it was, my habitat was supposed to look like a telescope. So it could fit into a circular uh, design and then pop up and to create extra space. And if it did actually print, um, it would have worked. Uh, and that was super uh, hard to create all these living spaces and components in that uh, set circle or, and the cylinder. But uh, yeah, yeah. So um, I rendered a couple of my uh, projects right here and uh, create an orthographic. After we designed, each of us designed a uh, prototype for our set, we had to write a report on it. And I wrote mine about the space station. And I did a lot more research on space stations that NASA and the University of Maryland uh, were researching. And unfortunate, and then we presented, we had a huge STEM day at our school uh, where parents and fellow students could come in. Unfortunately, I don't have any of the pictures that they took, but it was super cool. I loved uh, presenting what I had done for the last five months. It was a five month project. Um, so I put a lot of work into it. It felt great to showcase what I did and what my members did. Uh, I had a great time working together um, while doing completely separate things. Uh, so on the STEM day, we all went to the library. We had this uh, huge trif uh, trifold uh, where we put everything that we did. Um, in a perfect world, we would have had all our 3D prints and uh, the person who was in charge of creating uh, uh, food, which was um, my friend Nick, he uh, bring uh, his little garden of uh, plants that he grew, which was super cool. I loved, uh, I loved watching that because he grew it. Um, and what I found my favorite thing was about uh, the project was the, the space theme that was like the first time that I had done anything uh, even remotely uh, that made me research uh, aeronautical engineering. And I think that space travel is extremely fascinating and I would love to in the future learn more about it. Uh, I liked working with my peers and helping them out on things that they didn't know how to do or things that I didn't know how to do and they helped me. Um, it was a great teamwork uh, and working together. So that is my uh, presentation. I know I went fast on a couple slides. So if you'd like for me to go back, I can definitely go back. Um, I'd love to take any questions, comments or concerns. Ryan, I have uh, one for you. Um, so you, you worked on the habitat itself um, and, and looks like you did the, the design and how it would potentially fit inside of a rocket um, to then be opened up on Mars. Uh, but did you get much into the actual habitat in terms of um, oxygen and water and resources and how those would be, um, how, how you would create those resources while you were there and to make sure it would, ensure, uh, would, would meet the needs of that colony? 
So what I was in charge of was creating the the space for it. Um, so the actual uh, design and where everything would be. So. Okay. I got you. Not, not too much into um, the, on the resource I was side. On how we would create where, um, I do remember from my research was that Mars has some on the poles, they have ice, which um, the, it could be feasible to drill into um, to create water. That wasn't had really anything to do with the, the habitat, but that was just something that I thought was cool because water is a necessity that um, would be a pain to bring over from Earth. So creating water on Mars, I thought was super cool because uh, they it are it already is on Mars, which. Um, but yeah, I didn't do a lot of research on the creating and the food. Uh, okay, thank you. So let me just ask a little <clears throat> little follow up to that one. So maybe I missed it, but how many how many people did you envision uh, occupying this this habitat? So from these photos, you can't get a really good uh, look, but in a couple in, I have two sets of living quarters that actually are inside of that. There's four sets of beds. Um, so in this colony, there would be four people, um, which is pretty small compared to some of the actual colonies and the prototypes that they have been designing. Um, but in this habitat right here, uh, four people. Got it. And did, did you do any research on how to get this habitat to Mars? How would this, what it would cost, how you would put it on a spacecraft, that sort of thing? Um, I did not do any research on the cost, but what we did do was we had a set of um, parameters that we would have to build inside. So I forget the exact specifics of the number, but it's supposed to enclose so it pardon, so it could fit inside the rocket. Um, so that carmet, uh, the telescopic uh, design was meant to make as much space fit into as little as possible so that when it was fit onto the rocket, it wouldn't take as much space up. All right. Thank you. Great, thank you, Ryan. And we're going to welcome our last presenter for the day, uh, Catherine. Okay. Um, my presentation will be on my engineering research and design project, which I was working on this year. And the design was a modified mammogram machine um, for accessibility. So the main problem is that women with disabilities are 10% like, less likely to have a mammogram in um, any given two year period than women without disabilities. Um, this is because it's difficult to st stay still for the imaging um, and because of transportation issues getting to doctor's offices. Um, and currently this is an issue in first world nations where um, mammograms are already more likely to happen, but um, my solution will help to make mammograms more accessible, not only for people with disabilities, but for people in um, low-income low areas. And this could help to increase the number of people being screened for breast cancer, and thus the number of people diagnosed with breast cancer and number of lives saved. So the current process for having a mammogram is well-defined. Um, you have to be standing up in a doctor's office in front of the large machine and um, a nurse or a CNA has to operate the machine 
Um, and they mammograms usually use x-rays, although um, ultrasounds are one solution, but not as um, effective as x-rays. And there are some existing solutions for people with disabilities, um, such as a shoulder x-ray attachment that attaches to the arm of a wheelchair. So that was my inspiration for this design. Um, there was a testimonial by a woman in Canada with a disability who said that mammogram machines can make you feel like you're from another, another planet because they're not designed with accessibility first in mind. Um, and in America, the uh, Americans with Disabilities Act forbids discrimination against people with disabilities, but it does not guarantee access. So if a doctor's office doesn't have um, an accessible machine, they can just deny care to someone who needs it and they'll have to find somewhere else. So that can pose an issue um, with transportation for people who can't drive themselves or don't have someone else to drive them, or if they don't have um, accessible public transport. So why do we still need a solution? Um, any barrier that is in the place of imaging, the most basic form of um, care and the first step towards diagnosis means a barrier towards care and um, a barrier towards diagnosing and um, treating a disease. So for some patent research, I started with looking at digital x-rays, um, which were patented by Dick Clark Turner and Radmedix makes the industry standard digital x-ray. Um, so there will be a panel that is put behind the part of the body that's x-rayed and the x-ray camera will send um, the rays towards it. It will create an image and then it can be sent by Wi-Fi to the doctor's computer. Um, some other solutions that exist for mobile, mammogra sorry, mobile mammography include um, mammogram buses. So they can go to an external location and women can go onto the bus and get their image taken. Um, one issue with mammograms is that they can cause skin bruising and tearing. So um, Hologic creates a silicone cushion that makes it more comfortable. And they also have detachable elements of the machine for accessibility. So this inspired me to think if you can detach, say, a, um, a hand, a hand bar, a handlebar on the machine, why not um, disassemble the machine and reassemble it around the person, designing it for the person's um, accessibility? And another solution that I decided wasn't viable was a, a a mammogram machine that expands the breast, but um, this is actually less effective. So we, I decided to stay with the traditional compression. Um, this patent is for an external 3D mammogram camera. So the camera can stand alone um, and it uses a digital X-ray. So um, for my project, I would use a stripped down version of this machine that doesn't include the clamp and thus um, is much lighter and doesn't have as many mechanical elements in it. And it could be uh, wheeled into the location that the mammogram is happening or disassembled and reassembled. So getting to the core of my idea, um, my idea is to adapt a mammogram machine to the woman, not the other way around. Um, so it's a free moving compressor that can attach to a chair or a wheelchair, and it will be adjustable to different um, sizes, A through J and K and so on for um, breast sizes, as well as different um, circumferences of a woman's body. Um, and the mechanics of it, there has to be a capability to compress horizontally and at a 45 degree angle in either direction has to apply 20 pounds of compression. Um, it will be used with x-ray and not ultrasound. So the materials have to be compatible with x-ray. And it doesn't require a thyroid guard because the x-ray is so targeted to one area and any um, additional radiation is negligible and less than um, background radiation. So I um, did a questionnaire to understand 
what the needs of our what the needs are of actual people who have mammograms. Um, and I wanted to make sure that since the main idea of my um, product was accessibility, I wanted to have this also be an open and accessible um, questionnaire. So I used gender neutral language and I made it anonymous. So no one felt any pressure to um, not speak ill of mammograms since they didn't know who was taking this, um, who was taking this questionnaire. So I asked about age, age at first mammogram, um, how often people have mammograms and what's stopping them. And I asked about um, if, if the people had disabilities and if so, how did that affect their experience? So the, the questionnaire was fairly successful. I had 250 participants um, at a variety of ages. Most women had their first mammogram at the recommended time, 35 to 40 years old. And 50% rated a mammogram five out of five. So the, the overall experience of having a mammogram is not that terrible for the average woman, but this product is not for the average woman, it's for women who are already having difficulty having their um, medical images taken. So one woman said, um, it's hard to fit mammograms into her busy schedule. Another one said that having celiac disease, um, which gives her fatigue, makes it difficult to stay still over the time of the mammogram image. So this is um, an image of a one step in my design process for the machine. Um, the materials, that I'll use are PEAK, which is a, um, an X-ray neutral structural plastic, and PET, which is an X-ray neutral clear plastic. Um, synthetic rubber for the, the grips that will attach the arms of the wheelchair or chair. Um, Non-metal, so plastic expansion fasteners in the area around where the X-ray is targeted. And then the machinery of the uh, machine I'll use hex axles, um, brushless motors, custom cut aluminum gears, and um, various metal bolts, nuts, and screws. And the main structural components will be um, either cut, like extruded aluminum or custom machined. So oops. this is a video of my um, CAD uh, design expansion and implosion. So I built a prototype, which is here. Um, it's 3D printed and I put it together with wood glue. Um, some of the pieces are have a tight fit, so they don't need um, fasteners to fit together. Some pieces needed glue, which in the actual machine prototype would be welded. Um, so there's three elements of motion on the machine. Um, it rotates side to side, so to one 45 degree angle and the other. And there are um, three settings where a key can be entered to keep it at that specific angle. Um, it slides back and forth on the frame from one side of the body to the other. And it clamps open and closed. Um, you can press, you'll press a button, the motor will run and it'll clamp closed using the gear configuration and then it can be opened again. So, the weight does not violate OSHA regulations and it can be carried and operated by one person. So the idea is one aid will operate the machine and then you have one um, patient. And um, it could be manufactured for less than $2,000 per unit, which is less than the current cost of a mammogram machine. Um, and the great thing about it is that it, since it's um, transportable, it can cover a greater, it can serve a greater area than a single doctor's office. Um, and while it will have to be sold at a markup to recover costs, um, the goal is to turn a profit ethically. 
Um, and the aesthetic of the machine, as you could see, um, there's this blue hood that I added to kind of hide the um, internal machinery. So I wanted it to, to look sterile and like safe, but also kind of modern, not necessarily hard and um, like how current mammogram machines have plastic coverings. I wanted to also have, um, if, if it's a machine that's going to be so close to your body, I wanted it to look kind of modern and have an obvious element of human design to it. And um, for the future, I looked at the research of Keshav Bimbra at WPI. Um, he's a PhD in biomechanical bio engineering, and he uses um, ultrasound images of the body and then AI analysis to aid in medical imaging. So his work takes a 3D model of the body and shows where to place markers on the skin. And then um, he has a, a long ultrasound machine that is connected to his AI program and analyzes the markers and then, excuse me, the machine um, is, can operate and automate it ultrasound. Um, so this avoids exposure to disease. It was originally designed for the COVID-19 pandemic, and it can save time since one person can operate their own ultrasound um, without the help of a nurse. So in the future, um, there could be body scans um, for mammography, which show where the woman should place her breast on the on the plate beforehand. Um, so this can just reduce the time needed. Um, I don't see a future in which women will be operating their own x-rays since that's exposure to radiation, but it, it can, it can um, expedite the process. So that is the end of my presentation and uh, thank you for listening. And do you have any questions? Sure, I'll start if that's okay. So uh, you said that the the cost of cost of unit probably about two thousand dollars. Now, do you anticipate that that's going to the two thousand is inclusive of the technology? You know, whether it's X ray or or whatever uh, on the inside of that. Um, I don't anticipate. I I was accounting just for the individual machine that attaches to the chair, not for the external X ray camera. And how would that, I mean, I, again, I don't know much about x-ray cameras. How big are they and how adaptable would that be to your design? Um, well, in a doctor's office, they're quite large. You know, they're larger than the scale of body and you have to walk up to them. But there are patents for um, 3D x-ray cameras, which are kind of just the size of a tripod with like a large box on top of it. Um, and then it can, they, there's a, a motor within it that would rotate it side to side. So it's small enough definitely to fit through um, doors and it can fit in a relatively small space. Thank you. I'll go next. Uh, so you, this design, the prototype you made, um, did you test it on any wheelchairs or other similar devices to see, you know, was it balanced? Did it was it comfortable? Um, and then how people are different heights and sizes. So did you see if it, it could, does it need to be more adjustable or is there anything, did you do any testing on the design and get any feedback from users? Um, so I was actually unable to have a full scale model um, machined. So I just had to do this one third scale um, 3D printed model, which is, it's balancing, you know, it's standing here on the desk um, and, hasn't been um, falling apart or falling over, but um, I didn't have a chance to have it tested on an actual user. Um, so I'm not 100% sure, sure if it will work um, in real life, but I'm, I'm confident that um, with testing, it would, it, it, the, the basic model of it is sound enough that, um, it would just take minor, minor modifications to um, have it actually working on a real body. And in terms of um, different heights and sizes, 
it does move back and forth. Um, the clamps are far enough apart that any side's breast could be put into the machine and compressed. And it could be built up to different heights um, with like rubber blocks that go over the, the arm of the wheelchair and then the, the machine is placed on top of them. All right, thank you. Uh, Catherine, uh, did you do any research on if there are any existing um, healthcare home services that are provided today that this could integrate with? Um, well, the main um, existing procedure that I was I was taking inspiration from was the mammogram buses. Um, so those don't necessarily go into the home, but they are the closest thing to um, a, a mobile mammogram that exists. But I think um, t the rise of like telemedicine and and home and um, and they called um, hospice care, like medicine is coming into the home already. Um, and it's only going to accelerate as far as I see, like things being shipped, shipping is always increasing with like Amazon and all that. So people are more willing to pay or, or um, take a leap of faith and have things come into their own home today than they would be you know, 20 years ago. So I think that there will be um, an enthusiastic clientele for this machine. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you to all of the presenters this morning. Um, I think we're now going to take a quick break. The judges are going to convene in a different room um, and we'll be announcing the winners very shortly. So everybody just wants to hang tight. Um, and judges, if you want to meet me in the other room, we can decide um, on who are the winners. Great. So first of all, just want to say another thank you to all of our students that participated today. You all had extremely um, exciting projects and you know we all were really thrilled and a uh, difficult decision for our judges to be able to, to pick winners because honestly you all did such a wonderful job. Um, with, before we announce the winners I want to also say a quick thank you to our sponsors again for, for making this possible to be able to give out scholarships to our wonderful students in Marlboro um, and thank you again to our judges uh, from Boston Scientific, Quest and DuPont, some of our you know top tier companies in Marlboro you know really exciting to have you guys here um, you know, listening to our students and, and helping us really build the pipeline uh, for future employees at some of your companies. So with that, we're going to announce, we'll, we'll announce the third place winner first, uh, then the second, and then we'll give the first place winner. Uh, so for third place, which will be a $500 scholarship, we want to say congratulations to Nikita. For the second place winner with a $1,000 scholarship would be Alex. And then our first place winner with a $2,000 scholarship is Catherine. So thank you to all of you. We're really excited. And, and Mark, uh, Mark Vital from AMSA will be following up with the students to, to ensure that we are able to get you guys the scholarship funds. Um, and thank you again for everybody today to be participating. Oh, and I don't want to forget, um, everybody else, uh, all the other students will also be receiving scholarships of $150. So with that, we want to say thank you to everybody. Um, thank you for your time this morning and to all the students, congratulations. And uh, we wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors. Thanks everybody, congratulations. Just, yeah. Great job everyone. Great job everyone, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>